spend a whole lot of time for many of you justifying like why this whole uh, having a voice assistant is like a really like near and dear topic to my heart. Um, there's, there's a long history of voice assistants. It goes all the way back to, um, to the 50s or so, but in particular I wanted to highlight a few things here. One, um, like the, the Knight Rider logo there, it's in our science fiction all over the place. Like interacting with the computer just by talking with it has been there forever. Um, it's also been portrayed as, as evil as Hal is there. Uh, point of trivia, the creator of Tetris was actually working, when he was in Russia, working with the KGB, because um, everybody had to work in that capacity at some point, he pointed out, or at least it's a legend, that he was working on voice, um, uh, voice assistant technology for the MiG fighter jets, which I thought was kind of interesting, and then later on went to uh, create Tetris and never looked back. So the whole point of this is that um, you know, the Jarvis, just a rather very intelligent system, I didn't realize what Jarvis stood for until recently. Um, I would argue that the, the, one of the most interesting things about Iron Man is that he had this assistant that he could just talk to and it would do things on his behalf. So that's why about two years ago when the voice assistant explosion came out, we ended up buying like four different um, Amazon Alexas. And we even have an Alexa in our car. Um, it's hooked up through this weird process that I could get into later if you're interested. But m my whole thing is I want to just be able to tell it to play a song when I'm thinking about it. And I don't want to have to go digging through, like clicking through a bunch of different windows or whatever else and, and all this other stuff. I just want to naturally speak to it. Well, that led off um, having that many voice assistants kind of led into how do they work, um, coming from an infosex side, what are their ways that they can be attacked, and I have a whole other like, talk on how to attack voice assistants and, and their, their surface area, their attack surface area. But this, it kind of was born out of that interest as well, like how could I make it my own? How could I, how could I build my own? What are the basic building blocks and, and all this other stuff? So the very first piece of a voice assistant is just getting access to the audio. How many of you have ever wrestled with uh, Pulse Audio or any of the audio subsystem in your, your uh, system? How many of you have ever like, actually dug into it to figure out what it's doing? That's another question. Now, for those of you who haven't, because I hadn't until I started wrestling with this, like how can I even get started developing um, an application that works with a microphone and a speaker? And the, the nutshell here is, uh, on a Linux system, because we are at the uh, Southeast Linux Fest, so I figure I need to, to point that out. Um, the, the hardware layer is the advanced Linux sound architecture. That is the driver layer. That's the part that actually deals with, with the, um, the kernel modules for, the, or for whatever uh, sound card or whatever else you have. On top of that, you have Pulse Audio. Pulse Audio is an abstraction over the your sound layer. Pulse Audio is usually run as, as the user that's running the system. In fact, they have a lot of built-in checks to say you can't run it as root as a system service. The reason that comes into to play is when you go to implement this on a Raspberry Pi, you're going to want to run it as a system daemon and Pulse Audio will fight you for it. There's, there's ways around that. But the great thing about Pulse Audio is that it has connectors to almost every system that, that you would want to run it on. So it has um, AUS, uh, advanced Linux sound architecture. That's one of the ones. It'll also hook into core audio. And I'm not supposed to say this, but at a Linux conference, I run everything on a, Mac's, um, a MacBook. That's what core audio is. Does anybody know what open SLES is? What system runs that? That's Android. So Pulse Audio will run on Android. It'll run on Mac. It'll run on Windows. It'll run on Linux. It'll run everywhere. And this is really an interesting to me because that means that I can I can actually hook into the sound system anywhere. Now, the other interesting thing about Pulse Audio is that you, it has the ability to pipe all of your sound, like an entire view of your sound architecture over TCP to something else, which is really cool because now I can take, uh, we, we could actually go into this whole other thing. I can create a Sonos system, a free Sonos system just using uh, Pulse Audio. And I probably should put an entire talk together just for that, because you can take the output of your, your desktop and pipe it into uh, 
several different sinks, several different raspberries all around your house and have a, a whole house um, audio playing system. Or you could become Batman. Remember I said that uh, OpenSLES is your Android phone? You could hook into the, the mic and the, and the um, speakers on your phone and pipe that back to your main system. All kinds of interesting things just to play with on this. But uh, one thing that I'll point out here is when it comes to an, uh, an open source voice assistant, uh, you can't, it, it pays off to be very, very familiar with, with Pulse Audio because that's where all of your, um, your interaction with this, the microphone, speaker, and all that comes from. The second thing that pays to know is the, uh, the audio format. In, um, in pretty much every system today, it's a pulse code modulation. PCM is how you map the raw data frames that are coming out of your microphone, or, or your, your raw data frames coming out of your microphone to something that you can actually use on the computer. It's basically just an array of numbers. Um, there's, for, for creating a voice assistant, this is the, the text or the entry. This is the command line of your application, is this PCM wave format. Where it becomes interesting to you, because I'm not, like, I'm still scratching the surface on audio engineering, but there's two pieces where it becomes really, really important. One is the, uh, the sampling rate and bit depth. What you sample it from, uh, what you use to, or to sample from your microphone, that's what you need to use throughout your whole system. Otherwise, you lose a whole lot of data, you lose a lot of um, granularity, and that's going to come in very important later. Uh, another thing that's interesting is uh, the, the human vocal range is between 300 and 3400 hertz. Now that means that uh, in an audio space, we'll see in a little bit, there's a lot of other stuff going on. But if we can define the range that we're looking at, then we can kind of cut down just to those frequencies and, and like throw out a whole bunch of noise. Uh, last little bit of interesting trivia, uh, the Nyquist-Shannon theorem tells us that we, we lose information if we uh, throw out things that are twice whatever our top frequency is. So if, if those of you have been looking at um, MP3s and you wonder why is it sample rate at 4,400 hertz, we can't hear things that high, this is part of the reason why. Now, combining that together, we're taking the data that's coming out of the microphone and we're trying to look for phonemes. Anybody, anybody remember uh, Hooked on Phonics? That's basically what we're trying to do with the computer. We're trying to, uh, so there's, there's some, this is what we need to do. We need to take the signals that are coming through the microphone, apply um, this magical math formula that actually applies to almost everything that, that I get nerd sniped by on its own, the fast Fourier transformation, which did, pulls out in a data frame, these signals are the ones that are the most prevalent. Now, if you take those, then you can um, match them together over time and say, these are the groupings of signals that map to a, a phoneme. Uh, the way that they, we'll get into how they work in just a little bit. But, um, so a phoneme, since I've run over that several times and I didn't know what that was until I started working on my own uh, Alexa system, a phoneme is a perceptually distinct unit of sound of a specified language that distinguishes one word from another, actually one syllable from another. So a phoneme is the, the basic unit of input. It would, like, it would be like the, it would be analogous to a key or a, a character that you've entered. Okay? One interesting thing about that, every language has its own set of phonemes. So this is the English language phonemes, and I'm not even sure that this is the entire phonemic chart of uh, English uh, pronunciation. And the other thing is it doesn't take into account the um, accents. Accents are something totally different. But in general, we're trying to take the sounds that are coming out, we're trying to map them to these phonemes. That's what it's all about. So other interesting like bits of trivia. Consonants and vowels occupy different frequency ranges. So, if you're, uh, when, you, when you can't hear somebody very well, and maybe this is the case here, I don't know, but if you can't hear somebody very well, it's more than likely because the audio equipment or the audio space is cutting out the higher frequency ranges. It's muddying that up. That's where the consonants, T, S, and stuff like that comes from, okay? And vowels occupy a more, uh, I think it's deeper in the frequency range. 
So you can hear the vowels, but you can't hear the consonants that well. So now you know why certain songs you start interpreting the words is not what the uh, artist was singing. It's because the, the song was like mashed up, compressed, and all that other stuff, and then the high frequency ranges were lost, and so you heard a T where there should have been an S or, or something like that. All right? That's important because picking out these consonants, remember I said that your, the frame rate or the frame rate or the sample rate matters when you go to like feed it through a voice to text system. You're going to come up with some really weird things and it's all because the quality of the signal coming in isn't, isn't good enough. Last piece of this uh, theoretical puzzle, maybe not last piece, silence. It, it's weird that we, we know it when we hear it, sort of like porn, right? We know it when we see it, we know it when we hear it, but from a math perspective, from like looking at the microphone, there's really no such thing as silence. There's always something going on in the acoustical space. On the lower uh, right, from your perspective, the lower uh, left-hand side over there, that is Microsoft's uh, quiet room. It's the quietest room on the planet, negative 33 decibels. Uh, and even so, decibels is just a measure of the power in the uh, sound space around you. Anyway, the sound room over there uh, at negative 33 decibels, from what I understand, people can't stay in that room very long because your ears start attuning to whatever the base level of sound is around you. Remember I said there's always sound. There's always something going on. So in that room, ends up being that it's like your own body that's making the sound, which is really cool by itself and also creepy, like bones grinding on bones and stuff like that. So um, it's important to understand and that sound from a system's perspective is a, is a unit of power. That's what decibel measures. So that you can uh, set your thresholds so that you can throw away work on noise that you don't care about. And that's, a, that's an important distinction there. Silence is noise that you don't care about. Weird sidetrack here. Um, your brain is attuned to throw out noises that you don't care about anyway. You just do it automatically especially those of us who are parents, we know this like really well. But um, you have to teach the computer to do that because it doesn't do it automatically. So how do we take all the things going on in the acoustical space and separate them out? I kind of hinted at it earlier. It's uh, this fast Fourier transformation, but it's a little bit more than that. We need to take a sample of sound and we need to divide it up a lot of times. And there's different methods for dividing it up. And if you've studied um, how to work with sound, the methods that I'm using are a little bit dated. Um, they're not the latest, but they do work. Um, and we'll get into the, the hamming in a little bit. But we're going to take, uh, yeah, we're going to take the hanning or raised cosine. And what that means is, like, let's say we've got a second of sound. We're going to slice it up into little bits of, like, maybe 10 milliseconds each. And they're going to overlap across that whole, frame, or that, that whole range. And we're going to take a Fourier transformation, which is what are the most prevalent signals at that time in that space. Then we take the range of windows and we say, out of all of these windows, which are the dominant signals that we've seen through this time? And it's basically just an array of numbers, the frequency, um, was it the dominant frequency and the power um, amplitude. And that's what we're using to feed into to the system underneath. And the reason I put a, spec, a spirograph here, does anybody remember playing with that when you were a kid? Um, unbeknownst to me, it actually had a, ma a strong mathematical basis to it. A spirograph is you uh, doing the work of a Fourier transformation in reverse. Whereas, sorry? Oh, anyway. Um, so it's, it's doing the, the transformation in reverse. Um, basically, you're, you're trying to take samples in time and come up with a rhythm that would make that sample. There's, there's a lot more to it, but you're going from uh, analog and trying to digitally represent it with a mathematical formula. How about that? And it turns out you can mathematically represent almost everything as a wave. Another weird physics thing that you can go off into. Uh, you can do uh, video that way, you can do images, audio, like it's all the same um, uh, method. So, how many of you have ever, uh, so the mic check 1212, it turns out there's a better way to, to uh, like test a microphone. 
And this came out of the 19, I think it was 40s or so, when they were testing microphones that they were making for the, the bombers and stuff that they were like coming out with. And they had to come up with a way to actually test microphones to make sure that you could hear every part of speech correctly. And that, that is testing the entire range. So there's something called the Harvard Sentences. And I, I wanted to put this in so that people would stop saying mic check one, two, one, two, because it doesn't really test anything. Now the picture here is from, there's so the Harvard Sentences, there's 72 stanzas of 10 sentences apiece. And they're designed to, um, what is it? They're phonetically balanced. They're designed to, to test every bit of the range of, of human speech. So the picture over here is, uh, so here's the, the Harvard sentence. Tea served from the brown jug is tasty. Now, if you don't have a properly calibrated mic, what you might hear is tea soaked in LeBron James is tasty. The reason I bring this up for a voice system is you're going to get false positives. It's a biometric system. And most always, the problem is your microphone. I have spent an embarrassing amount of money on microphones. And there is a huge quality variance. For those of you who are used to buying computers and you have like every spec that's spelled out, you don't have that for microphones, which is weird. But here's a way to go around and you can test, and you can test it from a, a, a more deterministic standpoint than just like blowing into the mic or, God forbid, tapping the mic. So what comes next? If we can pull, if we can sample the audio space, and if we can pull out the dominant frequencies, the next thing we need to do is take these dominant frequencies and map them onto what we've come up with um, constitutes a, f a phoneme. Okay? The way that we do that is something called a hidden Markov model, uh, or actually a Markov model, and the hidden part means that we don't know what the Markov model looks like until we train it with some data. So a hidden Markov model is where we're training it. We have, uh, there, there's a process to, to say this phoneme um, looks like, like it has these frequencies or whatever else. So the, uh, the very basic Markov model is up in the, uh, the top left, or yeah, up there. It's up at the top. So it's a coin flip. A Markov model is 50% one side or the other. Okay, it could go either way. The hidden Markov model at the bottom maps uh, the uh, saying one and two. Uh, one, and you also get a little bit of, uh, of an introduction to the phonetic alphabet or how do you spell a word phonetically. Uh, so if you start with a, a W sound, it's immediately going to go to the top portion. And I, I apologize, I don't have the percentages there just yet. But if you were to say a W sound, then it's probably a 90% probability that it's going to the top. So it would start looking in that side of the tree. And if you started saying a uh, then it's going to say, you know, it's a tree search. We're going through and we're trying to map what you're saying to the pieces of speech. It's also important because when you're working on these systems, you're, uh, how lazy you are in pronouncing a word, like directly translates to the model, like not knowing what you're saying. And so if you've ever spoken to uh, uh, Alexa or Siri and it didn't really get what you were saying, then it's, it's hunting the Markov model and it didn't have a good match. Another interesting thing that could come into effect here, since we're on that subject, is aliasing. If you're trying to talk to a device and somebody else is talking or st other stuff is going on behind you, whatever's going on behind you could come in as part of a vowel that it's hearing. So that's why you have to repeat yourself sometimes to your device. We find this a lot when we're uh, talking or yelling at the device in the car because there's all kinds of other things going around us. So those things, basic building blocks, the hard problems here, we're not going to do far field processing. I'm not going to try to solve that right now. Part of the reason is because far field processing requires really finely tuned models. Weird uh, anecdote here, when the Alexas first came out, they could hear you all the way across the room because the models were tightly trained. Does anybody know why they don't do that anymore? Do what? Because, because somebody, um, because it picked up, it, it was too um, fine tr or hair, hair triggered because it would pick up uh, Alexa, call so-and-so, and then somebody's like 
dinner conversation got recorded and sent out and Amazon got embarrassed. So what they did was they said, nope, we're going to raise the thresholds. Now you have to basically yell at the device. Um, I mean, it's possible, but the problem is it, the model becomes really loose as far as what it will trigger on. Um, part of the reason why we're not going to do far field voice uh, processing is because it's, uh, it falls prey to the inverse square law, which means that a microphone, uh, there's a lot of things that, that kind of fall prey to this, but the amount of signal that, that, is, um, that is inherent in an audio degrades by half over time, or actually more exponentially. So if you're a sound engineer, one of the reasons why there's a mic right here rather than right here or here is that the audio quality um, degrades by, by a square of the distance, which means that the best mic is going to be one that's right on your lips. Um, and we need all the help we can get if we're building this thing on our own. Uh, other interesting trivia there, uh, Echo Dots Generation 1 and 2 had seven mics because they really wanted to pick up the voice. Now they only have... Uh, four, I think, and then they packed more speakers into it. So the ones that are out now, the latest generation, are actually worse than the ones before. Um, phony models depend heavily on the training equipment. That is, a model that came from you uh, won't work exactly on your system, or won't work exactly the same on your system if you're using different mics and, and different setup. Uh, the other part of that, are, there's, uh, so that means that our off-the-shelf results, I'm going to go ahead and like break it to you, it's not going to be the best. It's not going to be anywhere near the quality of a Google or an Amazon. But it should at least get us to where we're going. Uh, last, there, there's more efficient mathematical models and technologies. Um, if you're taking notes, Tacotron is a really fascinating uh, Tacotron trained on WaveNet data. Um, that's actually the basis of where we get a lot of um, deep fakes. Um, but that's, that's a whole other realm. I wanted to work on off-the-shelf type, especially old off-the-shelf technology that I can use in a Linux system. So we're going to sidestep all of the great, like latest and greatest, and we're going to go back to things that were developed a couple of years ago, or a little bit more. Um, so the heart of our speech-to-text is a system called CMU Sphinx. Um, it was originally written in Java by an open source by the Carnegie Mellon University in 2000. Um, the latest one, or the latest version, is 5 pre-alpha, which still cracks me up because it's been in pre-alpha for three years now. Um, this is also, it's a university project, and there's a lot of papers that depend on, on CMU Sphinx. And because of that, it comes with a lot of different models. Weirdly enough, latest, or the latest models are Korean models. So you've got a pretty good amount of English, um, I think Spanish, Korean, and I'm not sure what other ones they have. Uh, Pocket Sphinx is a C implementation of the Sphinx library, the Sphinx system. It's um, written for embedded systems, especially ARM-based systems. And you see where I'm headed with this. It's all going to go to the, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's lots and lots of knobs and settings. There's power settings and syllabus, like like how to how to treat the different um, how to treat different words and the power, the emphasis on the words, like t detecting those. There's entire projects that's just for tuning the the, the different uh, settings within this project, just to get the best results. Um, so along with CMU Sphinx, you could use it as just a general, like give it a, an English language model and have it just try to detect words, um, all English words that it knows about. That's very compute intensive because remember I, I said a minute ago that you have the, the Markov models. You're first of all sampling, um, sampling audio space and creating these windows is not cheap. It takes a lot of computing power. Searching through the phonetic database, the, the Markov models, for every syllabus that's spoken or every um, sound event that comes through is also very expensive. So we're going to cheat here. We're also not going to get into natural language processing, but we're going to cheat. We're going to say, give it a, a list of keywords, and from that list of keywords, it knows to do certain things, like play Pandora or um, do, you know, do something. There's, there's another project that somebody has out there for commanding a robot. Forward, back, left, right, speed up, slow down. The reason for this is because it, um, 
especially on an embedded system, it becomes not very performant at all. Now you can get around this, remember I said earlier where Pulse Audio can take the audio sample and send it to a more beefy system to do this searching. It's not gonna be as uh, real time and that's why your Alexa does what it does or, or Siri or whatever else. It takes the samples, performs the Fourier transformation and just streams that to a central server. And that's where the, uh, the real processing comes in. It's effectively like a Google search with voice. But for our, for our uh, purposes, everything's done on the same device. So it needs to be, um, we need to cut down the search space. Uh, this was, actually, I, I need to go back. This is the Audrey system from uh, 1950s or so. It was one of the first uh, voice to text systems. It was from, uh, uh, from, from Ma Bell, uh, just detecting numbers. And this one is the first text-to-speech system. And there's a video on YouTube. It's, it's really hilarious because you, like, reach into the device and you, like, choke a goose while you're, like, doing the, the organ on it. But anyway, uh, the <laughs> so the, uh, the text-to-speech part, because the natural way to get or the natural user experience for a voice assistant is going to be something that speaks back to you. And basically, this is the reverse of what we had before. The, I would argue the hard part is detecting, like going from speech to text. Going from text to speech is a lot easier because all you're doing is saying, here's the word, and then it has to parse that word into the phonemes and then say, here's the, the phonemes that I found in the database. Let me play these audio samples. The real trick, though, is, um, is what's called prosody. And I may be saying this wrong, so if there's someone who, who knows how to say it better than I do, I've just been reading it in my head. Um, so anyway, uh, eSpeak is the library or the open source program that, that I'll recommend for this. And the NG part is adding this prosody. So prosody is taking the phonemes and the word, it's basically the accent, how you emphasize a word, how you, it's, prosody is like the uh, prose or like, you know, your flourish on the, on the word. Accents come from this, um, all that. Uh, so last part of the text-to-speech, we could either feed it raw text or speech synthesis markup language, which the latest version of that is 1.1, and this is the, um, this is basically the HTML of voice, because you can say in the speech synthesis markup language, and, and if you develop any Alexa skills, this is part of the Alexa skills too, is uh, take this number and pronounce it as digits, or pronounce it as a uh, numerical set, base 10, or, or whatever else. And I have down at the bottom here, Amazon is the MSIE of voice, because if you look at the SS, um, SSML standard, uh, Amazon's added their own thing, and I, I don't really blame them, because theirs is the dominant player in the market, but they have their own special tags that know it, that's not part of the SSML standard. So, just... Like how to like playing background music or like background tones or something like that while you're saying something. Uh, the other thing that's interesting with this is that there's no uh, SSML and, and all these other uh, pieces don't really have security baked in. Again, whole other talk, but just thought I'd throw that out there. So to tie it all together, Pulse Audio for the mic access, uh, Pocket Sphinx for text to speech, uh, eSpeak. ESpeakNG to deliver our responses to the user. And uh, uh, some other projects worth mentioning before I go into this demo to show you like how it all ties together. Uh, there's the Jasper project, uh, which tries to do all this, like tie it all together. And then there's the robot operating system, which is kind of interesting. It's not just for voice assistant. It goes way beyond that. Um, I looked at both of these, and they were a little bit more complex for my taste than I wanted. So that's why I ended up developing my own. So, with that in mind, let's go in and see if we can do this. Uh, first of all, I have to make sure that I'm on the right Wi-Fi. All right. I'm going to cheat and look at my notes. And I have this all in a uh, GitHub later for you guys if you want. 
Uh, so the first thing is make sure that Pulse, uh, the Pulse Audio daemon is running. Um, it was, so if it wasn't running, sorry about that. If it wasn't running, then I would run this command. Uh, this command is to run Pulse Audio as a daemon load the native TCP driver that's already built in, you find that everywhere. And the other interesting part is I'm going to allow these, or this like local host and also this specific IP range. Does anybody know where I'm heading with this? Actually, I already wrote it in there. Anyway, this is the Docker IP range that I have. And I'm going to allow uh, anonymous access. There is a cookie-based cookie, cookie -based access, but it's, um, it's more than I want right now. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to subject, subject you guys to this, but uh, actually, no, since we've got it tied in, and I just really want to play this. Uh, no, not yet. So I'm going to run Docker. And one interesting thing about Pulse Audio is if I've got Pulse running, if I've got Pulse running on the host, then I can share my Pulse audio from the host through to the Docker container. That means that I can develop in the way that I usually like to develop, which is self-contained, and in this case, it ends up technically being a Linux system. So, the other parts of this, I'm telling it that my, my Pulse server is this Docker for Mac localhost, which always resolves to the host at IP address. I'm giving it my pulse configuration here, same thing, mounting that into the container, and I'm mounting a, a chunk of code, which is the very beginnings of this do-it-yourself Jarvis process. <coughs> and then I'm using this magical Pocket Sphinx Go um, image, and this is available on GitHub too. All it is is uh, the Pocket Sphinx library with uh, Go bindings, because I, I do Go, Golang uh, development. There's also Python bindings. There's the raw C, live, uh, C bindings, if you're interested in that. Probably, if you're, I mean, I encourage you to take a look at the Go bindings, because I like Go as a language. But if you're more comfortable in Python, there's a lot of write-ups on that, too. So we come into um, the Docker container, and then we can, I said earlier that it's it's useful to know the PACTL commands, so list sources. And so we get all this data back, and I have some other weird um, audio components going on, so I have to hunt through this. In most systems, you only have like one default in and out. Um, so anyway, it pays to make sure that these are set to the, to the right defaults. Otherwise, it'll be playing on something that you're not actually listening to but I'm pretty sure that my defaults are set properly. Set. And it, just to make sure that it's set properly, I'm gonna scroll back up and make sure I set it. Let's see, I was listing sources. A source is the audio coming in. So I'm gonna say the built-in microphone, which is source zero. And then I'm going to PACTL list syncs, and this is the things that I can play audio out through, and I'm going to set the default sync to, to the system out, which will probably be one or zero, looks like it's zero. So the great thing about Pulse Audio is now that I've got that set, every other application that just uses the default will use what I just set as the default here. So. Just FYI. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run uh, I'm going to run Pocket Sphinx, and at first I'm just going to run Pocket Sphinx with uh, without keywords. There we go. That's why that looked weird. So the Pocket Sphinx without keywords looks like this as it starts up, and I don't know if you saw that earlier. I'm going to talk to it a little bit more here, just so that you see that it is like not at all calibrated. Okay, that was enough. But you see that it's looking through a search space of over 20,000, um, actually I think it was 40,000 words that it, it loads here. 
And the, pro the reason why it's inaccurate, this lattice is basically the uh, search space there, um, or the, the way that it's searching through all those nodes. There it is. Uh, 27,000, or no, 278,000 words, and, and like all this, like a massive search space. And it's not getting, like, there's also noise in the room and other stuff, but it's not picking up my voice properly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these keywords. Now the keywords come from this command text here. <clears throat> and this, these are the commands that I want it to specifically recognize. I don't want it to just like broadly interpret whatever English is spoken because I'm going to get a bunch of gibberish out unless I have a highly tuned um, model. Does anybody remember uh, Dragon naturally speaking preferred? Like that was, so Dragon was all about getting that model like super fitted to your voice. This is not that. So anyway, I'm going to take these, uh, these phrases and I'm going to feed them into, uh, let me think. I'm going to feed these phrases into, there it is, no. There's a handy program, and I'll have to find it on the, the website later. It's in my notes. But um, I feed the phrases into their, the, the website to get out uh, the pronunciations and the different, um, uh, well, the, the different vowel or the different uh, parts of speech that we're looking for. So what that looks like is each one that comes out is numbered. So I've fed in these commands, and what I get out are these sentences and these language models. So basically what I'm giving um, Pulse Audio, or not Pulse Audio, what I'm giving uh, Pocket Sphinx is a custom language model. And it's not the entire English, English language model, it's just the language model that I want it to detect from my own commands. And this also means that if I want to expand the command set, then I'll just send it another um, set of commands to, to recognize, feed that back through, get this language model too. Um, I also said there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of tuning that can be done. Uh, that comes from the pronunciation, or no, it comes from the dictionary here. If you have a, a, a speech impediment or if you um, just say words in a really weird fashion, you can hand edit this to match what you're actually saying. Interesting note. So, moving on from that, I've got, so the first one I showed you was without keywords, and now I'm gonna show you the one with keywords. Now this one should only listen for things like Jarvis. Jarvis, play Pandora. Yeah, because really, like getting to that point, just from the like getting to the point where you can now get words that are triggered, and then you can, I mean, now you guys know it's pretty trivial now. Now we just go do an action, like go get a, a command line interface to Pandora, a piano bar, and go play it, right? Yeah, <laughs> this guy knows what I'm talking about. So you just hook in a bunch of different programs. Now it's just a, a giant switch statement. Now, what you could do is you could also combine and cheat a little bit to say, if you hear this keyword, start recording audio, and then either shift that audio off to a more beefy system to do something with, or uh, one of the, the directions I was starting to take this was, I like, I like the idea of building a... Um, like a programming language on my own to be able to tell my systems to do different things. So taking notes and then like basically formatting those notes with text. And that's what this whole system is uh, building up to. So uh, with the keywords here, and then uh, just because like you're probably thinking, well, you know, you got the pocket, you know, the pocket sphinx continuous thing to work, but how do you actually like 
grab the output of that and do something with it? Oh, I'm glad you asked, my hypothetical interlocutor. So, we're going to go into, uh, into this program. And my apologies if you're not a native Go programmer. I don't think it should be that, that um, outside to, to learn about. Uh, what we're doing is we're starting in the... Let me compress all of this. Because what you have is effectively the... Okay, so the main, the main function, and we're going to do app run. First thing we're going to do is start up the port audio system. And the port audio system is going to just use the defaults. It initializes. That comes with the defaults. That's why I was talking about PACTL earlier. Then we're going to initialize Sphinx. And we're going to give it our um, hidden Markov model. Now you know what HMM stands for. The dictionary, uh, the language model. And just to point out, too, we're not... When I gave it its own custom commands, I didn't change the hidden Markov model for that Pocket Sphinx is using. I just told it only actually care about this subset. You could change the HMM out. There's an entire learning section. Yes, sir. Did you say Pocket uh, Sphinx does garbage or uh, is, is Shell syntax or is there some sort of standard representation? That's a great question. There is actually a standard. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the what that standard is called right now, but it does use the, the standard because it's used in a lot of uh, academic journals. So, yeah. Yes, sir? Not the inter Well, it... No, yeah. Well, yeah, there's... there's a, There, so there is a transliteration. Um, I'm not sure what the, the name of it is right now, but it's, uh, yeah, sorry. No, it is a standard. I'm not really sure what the standard <laughs> is right now because I haven't gone into, like, modifying the phonemes yet. I just use the stock stuff that comes with the system. Do you know what the uh, standard is? There's, like, a, like a it, it's a linguistic standard because it's not just used in computational. It's actually used to, like, to study systematically other languages or and English too, but and it's also used in like the medical literature. Like you can hear these vowels but not these, and and like it really you can really get into the weeds on that. Um, anyway, last last interesting bit on this: um, we set the sample rate and um, starting the system. The only thing we're going to do is we're going to open the stream from port audio, and we're going to give it a callback here, which is every time you get some data, basically feed that data into Sphinx and see if Sphinx will make a prediction. Okay, And then once it comes back with a prediction, this hypothesis here, which hypothesis is called here, and this is the specifics of the code is different, of course, in Python, but the overall is the same. In Python, it looks like this. We're opening up port audio, we're opening up Sphinx, and we're, we're taking the, the audio from port audio and we're sending it over to Sphinx. One optimization, like I was saying with silence, in order to make the system not run hot all the time, you probably want to calibrate like what your notion of silence is so that it's not just continually shoving data into to Sphinx audio. This is an optimization I haven't made yet, but I was thinking about it this morning. It does need to be made. But at the end of it, once you get a detected keyword, that's where you go off to the races. So to show you this piece in action, um, for those who are native Go uh, programmers, Running it as go run treats it as a script, and that's not really the way that people suggest. Um, but let's see. Running it. Okay. All right. Jarvis. Jarvis, play Pandora. So that's it. That's the beginnings and the end of your entire um, system. But wait, there's more. 
So that is the, uh, the system itself, like the framework of the system. Now, how do we take that system and miniaturize it and use it everywhere? So, like I said, I like running uh, Raspberry Pi in my car, or I like running um, the Alexa voice assistant in my car. I'd like to be able to run this in my car and use Piano Bar on that to, to just uh, play or, or like extend it however I want. Because one of the sad things about um, Amazon Alexa is that it has no location awareness by itself. So when we're driving down the road, like on the way here, we can't just tell it, hey Alexa, where's the next uh, gas station along the route or something like that. Now other voice assistants, especially Google's, can do that. But I'd like to be able to do that. So if I have the keywords and I can just hook into here, then I can extend it and actually make it super useful for, for our life on the road. So what you do is you start with a Raspberry Pi Nano, WH, with, which stands for wireless with a hat. Um, if you can solder these things on your own, be my guest, but I can't. So, um, And then add to it one other piece, which is the Raspi Audio Mic Plus hat. Uh, that has two onboard speakers, a breakaway mic, and uh, it has posts on it where you can connect speakers to it, like external speakers. It also has a really big red button. Anybody know what I would use the big red button for? To have it not continually record all the time. Since it's right there in the console, I can just press, hey Alexa. That, that cuts down a lot of um, processing. The uh, one thing I'll note about it is the arrangement is novel, but the, uh, the mic on it isn't that great. So probably want to add your own. Another, another valid option is a Bluetooth headset. The great thing about Pulse Audio is Bluetooth is also supported out of the box. That's really cool. You can actually have your own headsets playing through the device and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Other note here, uh, the Raspberry Pi Nano is half, I think it's a 500 megahertz, like not very powerful at all. It's very easy to swamp this system. Uh, the Raspberry Pi A Plus has the same processing power as a B, I believe, and so that's where you'll see a lot of people um, switching to it. Whatever floats your boat. So start with the Raspberry Pi W, the H, the post there, or the H, the hat piece, and uh, add this, Raspberry Pi Mic Plus. Now, I checked their website right before I came to the conference, and they have a link on there to go buy it from Amazon. Um, I clicked on the link, and it, w it took me to the Raspberry Pi uh, Audio Plus, which is not the same thing. And I was getting really depressed about that. So I wrote the guys and I asked them, like, when are you going to have the Mic Pluses back in, in stock? Because I figured you guys would want to know. And they said that it's going to be back in stock June 23rd. Uh, just FYI. I love this, this piece here. It has everything built in. It means that you don't have a whole lot of cables and everything else going everywhere. And so that's what it looks like, all assembled and put together. And it's about yay big. So... If anybody wants to get a closer look at it, although that one's pretty big too. So the two onboard mics, um, yeah, two onboard mics, post to connect if, you, if you're if you really like hard audiophile or something like that, you want to hardwire it into your car or something. Um, one piece that's interesting in the middle there is the mic is designed to be broken off and there's a ribbon that it comes with. And the reason that it comes with a ribbon is because the raspy audio people have this... Uh, this really cool video online of taking the, the mic and basically just doing a hard transformation on the audio coming out of the mic and the audio being played through the speakers. Just a simple vocoder or voice translator. They put it in a, uh, they put it in a Halloween mask, which I thought was kind of funny. So, um, that's it. Anybody have any, uh, any questions? This is also where the code uh, examples that I was showing earlier are going to be at. Oh, and uh, I really do need to point this out. Uh, we are hiring, so if you want to work with uh, smart people doing big data, um, reach out to me. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm curious if you've uh, if you mentioned all the Mycroft projects. Yes, I actually have a subscription to Mycroft. So there's actually several. So for those who aren't uh, familiar, there's several other like semi-open places that try to get the model. They're... What they're bringing to the table is they will do a much better job of detecting uh, the words than um, Pocket Sphinx will. 
Pocket Sphinx is, in all honesty, it's not the best. It's better than nothing. And that's pretty much what we have in the Linux, the open source space. So we have a lot of other people that are semi-free. Uh, Snowboy is another one. Um, pretty decent company, but it's not entirely free. Uh, Mycroft is one. Mycroft actually has, yeah, th th theirs are interesting. Those of you who are interested in cloning voices, um, Lyrebird is really interesting. They have an API that's available. Uh, the first thing you do is clone your own voice to make your own voice, like the, the speaking back, which comes in really handy if you want to like attend a bunch of meetings and just say things like, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> not, that, not that I would recommend you doing that, but it does help you multiplex yourself. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of semi-free things, and if you're, if you're gonna go that route, uh, I'll also throw in there, um, Amazon has an API, Google has an AIY project, which is actually what, the, um, what this is tied to, uh, the Google AIY, which is basically a do it your, it's another do-it-yourself uh, voice assistant, and they have an entire kit, but it's not entirely open source. That was one of my constraints for this project, is that every piece of it, I wanted to make sure it was open source. Uh, but if you're open for the semi-open source, Google's open, uh, Amazon, let me see, uh, you're going to laugh, but IBM's Watson has its own API, and in all honesty, Watson is cheaper per minute of recording than any other service out there. They're also a lot more flaky than every other service out there, so your mileage may vary. But there's, there's tons of options like that, yeah. Um, in fact, a hybrid system might be really useful, too. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, not only m myself pronouncing them different, but uh, correcting my kids when they're trying to talk to Alexa, and Alexa's like, I don't know what you're saying. It's because you're talking like a southerner. <laughs> anyway, yes sir. Mary TTS? Mm, no. Okay. Okay. Cool. No, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't encountered that. Like I was saying for the TT uh, text to speech, I think the Tacotron project, uh, it's also by Google, is one that shows the most promise. Mostly because they get a uh, a little bit away from just just thinking about it in terms of phonemes, and you can actually overlay other voices like human voices. That's where Lyrebird and those are, are coming into play. Um, but yeah, I'll take a look at that one. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, best in terms of the, the Raspberry Pi, about 44,000. Um, the higher you get, though, on any other device, the more resolution you'll get. So. I mean, it's like anything else, right? But there's only so much that the Raspberry Pi, especially its onboard uh, digital audio converter, can handle. So the standard 44,000, so. Does the Pi work? Does it work? Oh, you're gonna make me go to the Pi, aren't you? Uh, uh, yeah, I did bring it. Live demo, man. <laughs> it's true. And, especially since I had it connected to, uh, I had it connected out in the lobby, and I'm pretty sure that my Raspberry Pi changed where it was. While I'm looking at this, do you have a question? I was just uh, wondering if you see the biggest share on the topic of access. Of access? Access, like Southern or other access. Oh. Yeah, interesting, weird fact, too. Your voice changes over time. Do you know that? So, uh, kind of getting into the uh, security talk, don't ever use your voice as a uh, password for something. But it, So it's not just accents. It's, um, like, biometrics, all, every, almost everything about us changes over time. So, so one thing that I've noticed is that the models have to be looser to be more useful. 
So the reason why, um, did, was anybody here a, a customer of Grand Central Station before it became Google Voice? Anybody use Google Voice? Does anybody remember the initial uh, voice or the, uh, the voicemail to text system as it came out? <laughs> I had, yeah, I, I had a, an, a really southern friend of mine that would always call and leave voice messages. And it was hilarious. I still have some of them listed. I did. Well, so they added this editor so that you could fix it. And what they were doing was trying to correct for accents, right? So... <laughs> yeah, but that kind of goes to show that just to get from hot garbage to lukewarm garbage, there's something in the uh, machine learning community that 90% is barely usable. To get to that, no, no, it's 98%. To get to 99% where it's actually natural takes an enormous, like an exponential amount of computing and training and all that. So it's, uh, yeah, so you were asking about uh, this thing. And I'm trying to remember where I where I stuffed it. There Still we go. Sort through hot garbage and text and listen to five minutes of ramble though. That's true. So here is the uh, the Python version that I'm gonna admit is probably hot garbage as well because I hadn't tuned it at all. I've been trying to get more towards the uh, the go side. But this was the uh, the Python side that I was showing earlier which opens it up, same model as the, the Golang. Um, let's see, detecting keywords, and the keywords that it's detecting are, uh, is this, uh, this piece right here. So it's a, an array, a slice here, and I'm not exactly sure what all it's giving. Oh, word, probability, start frame, and end frame. Um, which the start frame and end frame are probably not important for you guys right now. But basically, you could use it to detect on keywords and then do something else with the data afterwards. One other note here is that the, uh, the bindings for uh, port audio are, uh, the libraries are, even though the library has been out there for three years, for some, somehow uh, the distros still have an older library still. So in many cases, it, it um, pays to, to, to build it yourself. Is the flashing light there mean something? Right there. OK. So I guess a, a couple of questions. Well, one more question, and then I'll, I'll head out. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What if you violate more of the Alexa or your car? <laughs> Probably more the, the Alexa, to be honest, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming out. I hope you got something out of it. And <laughs>